Good afternoon. Okay, before we begin, let's pray. Dear God, we want to pray for today. We thank you that we can gather here to hear your word. God, we pray that as we study your word, you speak to us. Help us to recognize our place before you. And God, we pray that we learn to live life that is humble, obedient, and trusting in you. So God, we pray that you be with us this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we encounter difficult situations in life, we often want answers, uh, solutions, or maybe a way out. Sometimes after we toil and toil, we may find an answer or we may find a solution. And we realize that we simply needed to look in the right place. And then we ask ourselves, how come in the first place we didn't just look here for the solution? So recently I heard a story I had some uh, family friends come and visit my parents. These are a couple from Canada. And this person went into a coma for about 13 days, this uncle. And the situation was quite bad. They said that, you know, if his situation does not improve, uh, they will have to take him off life support. So the wife was very worried and she was thinking very hard what, what she can possibly do. And then suddenly she remembered, you know, some point in some uh, unrelated incident, somebody shared with her this disease called Legionnaire's disease. Okay? And she shared this disease with the doctors. She said, like, you know, can you test for these few things? Because they couldn't find out what was wrong with this husband. And she shared a number of things that like, can you please test for these things? Legionnaire's disease, tuberculosis, something that she just remembered. They tested, and true enough, it really was uh, Legionnaire's disease. They administered the right uh, antibiotics. Then he recovered shortly after. Okay. So here it's just an example, right? Where where you look really matters. Sometimes we have no idea where to look, but once we find the right thing to look at, actually uh, it becomes better. Another example, recently I've been feeling a uh, toothache, some dull ache at the back of my teeth. Then I wonder why, you know, what's wrong? Shouldn't be feeling any toothache. I removed all my wisdom teeth already, you know. If y'all remember a while back, I removed all my wisdom teeth already. I shouldn't have any more problems. That's why I removed my teeth in the first place. Um, so recently, we went to see the, the dentist, our regular checkup. Then I told the dentist all these things. You know, I feel some uh, aching at the back of my, my mouth. Then he said, oh, okay, okay. So he take down all these notes. Then after, after me will be Linda. So she asked Linda, Linda, I got some homework for you. Then Linda, huh? how come uh, I go to dentist and I have homework? Linda likes to see the dentist because she keeps her teeth very clean. So she likes to go there and then the dentist will say, oh, good job, no, well done. So uh, she said, how come I got this homework? Then the dentist said, I need you to tell me whether Ernest grinds his teeth at night. And she said, oh, yeah, he does. You know, uh, straight away the dentist said, oh, okay, so that's your problem. You have been grinding your teeth. So that's why my jaw has been aching, grinding my teeth because of stress. Stress because of this sermon. Oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> stress because of work. And maybe this sermon also. Okay. So really, when you look in the right place, you find out the truth, right? What is the problem? You just need to look in the right place. And today in the passage, uh, Elihu is also telling Job uh, the right places to look. Okay. Where he should be looking at to gain a clearer and truer understanding of the situation that he is facing. So just a quick recap, right? Job, for anybody who is joining us today, uh, if we need a big refresher, Job is going through a lot of suffering. And his three friends came to talk to him. And uh, after a series of back and forth between Job and his three friends, uh, finally, they have all become silent. Nothing left to say, right? And so now Elihu is speaking. And you may ask in this picture, where is Elihu? Ah, that's because Elihu is the one who took the picture. That's why you cannot see him, right? <laughs> so Elihu, when he talks to Job in the past few uh, chapters, soon he'll speak a few more, and then after that, God will uh, speak directly to Job. Right, just to recap what was last shared by Elder Greg, talk about God's absolute justice uh, and perfect justice in Job chapter 34. And the way that Elihu addresses Job it's always true something that Job says 
and then Elihu will respond with either his thoughts or some replies, right? So Elihu will see he often quotes Job. And so here, we see uh, him starting with this, linking back to this whole idea of justice. He says, do you think this to be just in verse 2? And what he is referring to is something that Job, he says that Job said, Job said that it is my right before God. In the NASB, it uh, even says that, Job says, uh, I am more righteous than God. Do you think that you are more righteous than God? Okay. So it seems like in Elihu's view, based on Job's speech, it sounds as if Job is almost saying that, you know, does Job think that he knows better than God? Does Job think that he is more righteous than God? Right? And specifically, it seems that this is because of this question uh, that Job us, which Elihu quotes, he says, what advantage have I? Right? How am I better off than if I had sinned? Okay? So essentially, Elihu is thinking, you know, is Job saying that there is no point in being righteous? Right? Is there no point in being righteous? And why he says this is that it seems like being righteous, according to Job's mind, like it doesn't have any benefits. Typically, when you are maybe sinful, you know, you're wicked in this world, you might get a hate in life. You know, you take shortcuts, you lie, you cheat, you get a hit. So what benefit is there to being righteous? Maybe in Job's mind, being righteous at least gives him a hotline, a direct access to God, such that when he speaks to God, he expects that God should at least respond to him because I'm a righteous man. You know? But it seems like this uh, benefit is not extended to Job because in all his suffering, you know, God has been silent. So what is Elihu's solution to Job? His solution is, he tells Job that you need to look up. Okay, you need to look up. What does that mean? He says that you, he answers to both Job and his friends, okay, because quite likely they too can learn something from this. He says you need to look up. Look to the heavens and look to the clouds. So this was a picture that I took just uh, outside. You can feel the heat coming down from this, uh, this picture, right? recently has been very, very hot, you know. And his example is that when you look up, you are reminded of the clouds and the heavens and how you can do nothing to affect them. How nice if everywhere I walk, I can drag the cloud with me and then block the shadow just nice as I'm walking, I don't feel any heat. How nice if just before I play my football, I can call the clouds to block the sun just from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., no sun, and that'll be great, right? But of course, even a child knows that this is impossible. We, no matter what we do, we cannot affect the clouds. We cannot affect the sky. We are just so far away from it. We are so puny and tiny compared to the clouds. And he's saying the same thing of God, right? He's saying that God and his ways, no matter what we do, whether we are more righteous, all our, whatever righteous things we do, it does not add to God. Whether we are sinful, it does not subtract from God. Even if we become sinful and then we repent, it also doesn't change God. Nothing that we do can change who God is. Okay? God doesn't become more powerful after we are righteous. God doesn't become uh, more less powerful just because we sin against Him. And there's nothing that we can do to compel God to respond to us or to uh, react to us in any way. And this is what Elihu is saying, right? Anything that we do, even your wickedness or your righteousness, it is confined to us, it starts from us, and it ends with us, right? It is not going to affect God in any way. Now, this is not to say that God will not judge us. God will still judge us for the things that we do, right? Uh, but God is not going to change his ways just because of something that we do to him. If he does change, then God is being merciful. But God has no uh, comp compulsion to do any of these things just because of our behavior. So, this may be something that we also often struggle with. When we are facing a difficult situation, sometimes we may think, you know, God is against me because of some past sins that I have done. Very natural for us to think so. 
sometimes you may think, oh, you know, if because of some past sins, God is behaving this way towards me, if I change my ways, maybe I become serious in my Christian faith, you know, uh, maybe I, my struggle is, how come I cannot, uh, how come at my workplace I'm struggling? How come in my relationships I'm struggling? How come in my family I'm struggling? Maybe it's because of something that I need to change and God will change. Maybe because we are very faithful in church, we often serve in church. You know why? I always uh, serve on Sunday. I'm always early to church. And we think that you know, God owes me uh, a response. God owes me something good because of how I have behaved towards him. Unfortunately, all of this is not true, right? God is not going to change his ways or how he behaves or reacts to us because of any of these things. And it will be helpful for us to remember that when we look up, we remember our place before God, right? God is God and we are his creatures and nothing we do will change that. Even though we, I think we very, many times we very strongly wish that we could, but this is uh, the nature of how God has made things. And so this is where Elihu, uh, I think, believes to be one of the errors of Job's thinking based on what he has heard. Right? He seems to be, uh, from Elihu's view, he seems like Job has been focusing too much on himself. Because he says, you know, you say it is, it is my right before God. What advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? Okay, Eddie who is saying that, you know, Job, you are focusing too much on yourself. You need to look up and remember that this world is not just about you. Okay, this world is God's world and we are only living in it. And God operates on his schedule and you need to understand and recognize that. So this is his reminder, look up. Okay, the first reminder for all of us as well. And so some things that we can reflect upon. Right? Do we recognize our status as creatures? Do we submit to God's will? Sometimes things happen to us that we don't like. Do we recognize that these things are God's plans and we have to understand that this is the way it is? Or do we sometimes question his justice and say, why is it God is behaving this way to me when I have been so good to him? It's not fair. Okay? God should be behaving this way. Okay? Do we insist they go act according to our expectations. Something for us to think about, right? Now, looking up and recognizing this status is one thing, but there's another solution that Elihu uh, gives to Job. And that is beyond just looking up, he tells him that you need to look beyond. What does this mean? So he says in verse 9, because of the multitude of oppression, people cry out and they call for help because of the arm of the mighty. So people often cry out to God when they are oppressed. The arm of the mighty, right? What is an example of this? Example of this is like that, right? This uh, child, Caris, is crying out because a, arm, a very strong arm is holding on to her. And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm in agony. Please. Relieve me from this agony, right? Sometimes we feel this way. But he goes on to say in verse 12 and 13, right, what happens, how does he describe these cries? He calls these cries empty cries. When they cry out to God, God does not answer. Okay? And God, he even goes as far as to say that the Almighty does not even regard these answers. This does not mean that God doesn't hear. No? God hears everything but God simply is not responding to them. Okay, God is not giving heed to them. And he says that it's because of the pride of evil men. But why? What makes these empty cries so empty? What is the whole problem with these cries? The question is because when we think about it, when we cry out in our suffering, when natural humans go through suffering, okay, it is very easy for us to cry out, right? This pride of evil men, what is it? Think of this situation again. When the baby is in uh, agony, the baby is crying out for help, okay? Just like us, when we cry out for help because of some pain that we want. And we cry out to God, does it really matter who we cry to? Or do we simply just want escape or relief 
from our pain. Quite often, we simply want escape or relief, right? It doesn't really matter who we cry to. We're not crying to God for God's sake, right? This baby may well be thinking of, you know, Guan Yin, okay, Buddha, Christian, Indian Temple, or Mother Mary, or it doesn't matter, right? What he wants is just relief. He doesn't want uh, someone specifically, he just wants to be out of that suffering. And likewise for us, when we go through suffering, we also want the same thing. We don't like discomfort. I know I don't like discomfort. You know? And does my discomfort drive me to God? Perhaps. But I think there are many times when my discomfort, whatever it takes, you know, I will pray to anyone as long as they give me that relief from my comfort. And so this is where the presumptuous behavior, that pride of evil man comes in. He's saying that people only go to God these people who are oppressed, they only cry out to God because they want this relief. And you can see that from verse 10 to 11, right? He talks about God as their maker. This is where our focus should be, okay? Yet, we do not give this uh, attention to God any other time except when we are suffering. And that is such a waste, right? Such a waste. Why? Because here, he talks about God who is our maker, Okay, this is the God who is our creator. He has given us our life. Everything that we have is from him. All the good things in our life are from him. Even the bad things are from him. But all good things, all things that we have are from him. He describes God, our maker, as one who gives songs in the night. Okay, what does that mean? That means that this is the God who gives us hope. Even when times are dark, God does not leave us in the lurch. In his word, he has promised us hope. We can even think about relief that we have experienced in this life in the past, good things that we have experienced even in a dark world. Right? This is a God who is not a, a, a wet blanket. He is also the God who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth. Right? So it is a very privileged position for us to be humans this position that we have, God teaches us more than the animals, right? For us to be born and created as humans, uh, God has unveiled this world to us that we can understand this world. This is a great thing, right? This is a great privilege. And this is because God is our maker and he has made us so. He allows us to understand and know his creation. And lastly, he describes God as one who has made us wiser than the birds of heaven. Now we have learned in previous uh, sermons about wisdom being the fear of God and knowledge of the Holy One. And so for us, you know, God has given us this very special position to know God, know God personally, to actually have a spiritual response to God more than the animals, right? Why birds of the heaven? Perhaps because of all the animals in uh, the kingdom, the birds are the highest in the sky, so symbolically maybe they are the closest to God, right? But even more than the birds, Okay, us humans can actually have that relationship with God through uh, the sacrifices, or rather through Jesus as our, uh, our sacrifice. So man is very special. And out of all of creation, right, God has given us this great privilege. And so it is such a waste, truly such a waste. And you can see where the pride of evil man comes in, where when we only suffer, then we go to God. Right? God has given us all these good things as our maker. We should be turning to him all the time. Yet very often, only when wow, work is tough, then I pray. Wow, I'm not feeling well, then I pray. Wow, I'm struggling in my, my relationships, then I pray. Very presumptuous and very prideful. I'll give you an example from a cardboard box. Imagine a child, a beggar child, who has lived his entire life sleeping on cardboard box in the street. Right? And then one day, a king walks past him, and the king decides to adopt this child as his own child, as his heir. Right? And he says, okay, I'm going to invite you into my kingdom. You are going to become king in future. This child, gong gong, okay, follow. Right? Then on the way to the palace, the child's cardboard box is taken away from him. You know, this source of comfort that he used to sleep on is taken away from him. He doesn't need it anymore. He's going to go to a kingdom, a, a castle, a great castle. Yet this child, because he has only known this cardboard box as his comfort, he starts to wail and he starts to moan. And, oh, 
oh, give me back my cardboard box. It's my comfort. I want it back. You know? Yet it is so silly because if we realize, if the child realizes that what is before him, right, a relationship with a king, a residence in a castle, a position of rulership, you know, then he will realize that actually all these things that he's moaning about, this cardboard box that he's whining over, is actually nothing in comparison to what is before him and what is offered to him. Likewise for us, when we only turn to God in our suffering, it is such a waste because we have so much more uh, that we can enjoy and appreciate of God, and so much more that is before us when we have this real loving relationship with God. Okay, And so a side note here, some of us might think from the first portion of this passage that you know God is impersonal, nothing we do affects him. Even in these verses, you see that it's not true at all. Right, verse 10 and 11 tells us very clearly that God is not a God who doesn't care about us. Rather, He is our maker. He gives us songs in the night. He teaches us. He makes us wise. God cares about us very deeply. Okay. So, this is truly a reminder for us to look beyond this physical world and look at this eternal reality uh, of God. And this is Elihu's reminder to Job as well. And so, I think it's easy for us to think that, you know, in all of this complaining, he calls it empty cries, right? Empty cries, where it's all of this empty noise of everybody just always going to God. God, please save me, please save me. But people are only going to God when they are going through hardships, right? And amidst all of this, there is no response. And the truth is that it seems like there is no response. But if we really look, okay, if we really understand what is happening, we will see that God's silence is actually very deafening. Very deafening. So much so that it is actually for our good. Right? God is pointing us to actually look beyond. Stop complaining about these small, simple things like cardboard or whatever, when there is something so much better, an eternal reality that is so much greater before you. Why are you moaning about these small things? And this is where, in the last portion of today's passage, uh, Elihu wants to drive home the message to Job. He wants him to look closely. Look closely at your own situation. But I presented these things to you. I told you to look up. I told you to look beyond. Now I need you to look closely at yourself. So earlier, Elihu had given Job two warnings. Right? First of all, he said, don't be presumptuous. Okay? Don't think that. When you look up, don't be presumptuous, right? Don't think that God will change just because you are more righteous or more wicked. God is not going to change. This is the first warning. Second warning is don't make empty cries. Don't be like those men who have, uh, who are pride, prideful, okay? Who only speak to God when they are in hardship. Okay, don't do this. God is more than that. God should be our focus. Look beyond your current hardship. Look beyond yourself and start to see God. And so now he says that, you know, these are the two warnings. In the last part, he says, these are the dangers that you are facing, Job. He says, how much less God, whether God will listen to you. If God is not even going to listen to these prideful, evil men, how is he going to listen to you? He says that, Job, you know, when you start to take God's silence to mean absence, because Job says, you know, I do not behold God. When you start to say that, you know, my case is before God and I'm waiting for God to respond to me. It is a very dangerous thing for Job to say because he is starting to sound like he is very impudent. He is starting to sound like he is very proud, more proud than these people because he's saying, God owes me an explanation. God owes me an answer for what I'm going through. He says, Job, be careful before you start to actually make this error. Be careful. The other thing that he's saying is that, Job, be careful that you do not sin in your speech. He says in uh, verse 15, right? You know, you think that just because God oversees transgressions, God does not punish the evil man. Do you start to assume that this means that God is apathetic? God doesn't care? God doesn't care about you? If so, then because Job might think this way, he starts to talk more and more. He starts to complain more and more. He starts to bring his uh, arguments before God more and more. Then this is the danger of speaking very thoughtlessly. 
and multiplying his words without knowledge. And he says, Job, you are in serious danger of this if you continue doing this. Right? So, if this is the danger for Job, then the truth is that Job has truly misjudged his situation. Right? He has misjudged his situation. And what he needs to do, according to what Elihu is saying, is that you now need to look closely at your situation and don't judge your situation wrongly such that you respond to God wrongly. And how do you look closely at your situation? You need to look up and you need to look beyond. Right? You need to look up and you need to look further. So, if Job starts to understand these things, what does it mean for him to do? Okay, what does it mean for him to do? To look up and to look beyond. How can he see that he should always be seeking God, his maker? Uh, someone who is so much loftier than he. How can he do so? So, some practical steps for us to learn from for today's passage as we learn to also apply this whole principle of looking up and looking beyond. So something that we can do to look up is to recognize that we are not the center of the universe. Okay? By praying, praying regularly, we start to recognize that our lives are at the mercy of God. Okay? We are mere creatures. And praying means that it is not just uh, a whole list of shopping, a shopping list of requests. Right? We are not just presenting our wants to God nonstop. Right? Praying is really a relationship with God, speaking with God, continually being connected to Him. And this means that when we even talk about praying, right, we need to pray correctly in the right way. And what does that mean? Looking beyond will help us to do that. Understanding that our current situation, our current, our current lives and circumstances are not the only focus of ourselves. Right? We need to look beyond to see God's purpose. What that means is that we need to study the Bible to know who God is, Okay. We need to know His will. We need to see everything from His perspective. right? We really need to see God's big picture, which is why all of us should go for God's big picture in the afternoon. Uh, advertisement was done. Okay, very good. Okay. So it is important for us to do these things. This is what it will mean for us to look up and look beyond ourselves. If we don't look beyond, if we don't understand the Bible, if we don't know who God is, how are we possibly going to know what is the focus of our life? It is impossible, right? We will not have any means to know what is beyond this life. So these are some practical steps for us and really for us to consider, right? When we talk about prayer, are we praying regularly? Do we pray with our family? Do we pray with our kids? Do we pray with our spouse? Do you pray on your own? Think about how when you are interested in dating someone, you are constantly texting them on your phone, right? Is our relationship with God a similar way where we are constantly speaking with God? Okay. Are we meeting our other brothers and sisters to pray? Uh, to pray for them, to pray for ourselves? Or even are we joining prayer meeting or IDG? Right, where we can share our prayer requests and remind each other that God is so much bigger than us and we need to recognize this. When it comes to looking beyond, you know, we can ask ourselves, how is your relationship with God? When you know someone well, you will know what he likes, you will know what he dislikes, you will know his plans, you will know his purposes. When we regularly read the Bible and make use of these opportunities that we have, okay, this is how we will truly learn to see beyond this life, see beyond our hardships, see beyond our current circumstances. Okay, and it will help us to see the true center of the universe, right? Not us as the center of the universe, but the true center of the universe. So going back to this, when people go through hardships, they often make empty cries to God, empty noise. And Elihu is telling Job, you know, you are in danger of doing this, making empty cries to God. And God's silence should be deafening to you. Because God's silence should be pointing you to look beyond. And yet, if you don't, right, then you are also in danger of ignoring God and looking beyond what you should be looking at. And so this is a reminder for us. This is a warning for us. If someone like Job, someone as upstanding as Job can fail, then how about us? Do we have a hope 
Of course, the answer is yes. Right? So Job might be close to being guilty of empty cries and ignoring a deafening silence. But for us, we have someone who is our hope. Jesus, his cries were not empty. Right? Reminder from Luke chapter 22, verse 42. It says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Job is in guilty or in danger of making these empty cries. We can remember that we have a hope, we have a saviour who called to God in his suffering, yet did not focus on himself. Jesus looked up and recognised that he is seeking God's will. Okay, this is our saviour, someone who is so much better than Job. Likewise, Job ignored, always in danger of ignoring God's deafening silence. Jesus himself, different, a different kind of silence that saves. His silence is a saving silence, right? From Acts chapter 8, as well as from Isaiah, he says, Like a sheep that was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. So likewise, just how God's silence in our suffering can point us to look beyond to seek something that is more than a temporal relief. Jesus' silence also is for our sakes. Right? Jesus' silence is because of his willingness to die on the cross for our forgiveness. Okay. So let me conclude. From today's passage, I hope that we can all learn to look beyond our suffering, see God as our maker, don't focus on ourselves, Rather, we must see that we are not the true center of the universe. Eh, rather, we are not the true center of the universe. We need to look to the true, true center of the universe, who is Jesus. Right? Even someone like Job can fail, uh, but we have a hope. Right? We have Jesus, our hope, uh, an eternal hope that when we look beyond and we see Jesus, it will give us a hope for any suffering that we can go through, uh, any pain that we can currently experience in this life. Uh, maybe I give us a few minutes to reflect on today's passage. Think about the difficulties that you face in this life, the times when we fail to recognize our status as creatures before God, uh, and also when we focus on our own agendas and we forget God's purposes. Maybe take uh, one to two minutes to reflect on this, then I will close in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to ask for your forgiveness for all the times when we are so presumptuous. We think that we only go to you when things are tough. But we thank you for your great grace and mercy in sending your son to die for us that we can be included in your kingdom and we can know you. And God, we pray that we do not take this for granted. Lord, we pray that you help us to remember to constantly look up and remember our place before you. Help us to recognize that we are merely your creatures and your servants. And Lord, that you are truly God. God, we also pray that you help us to look beyond ourselves, to look beyond just our small kingdom here on earth and realize that, Lord, you are building your own kingdom. And God, we pray that we will be committed to studying your word, to know you, Lord, they will be committed to studying your word, to know how we ought to serve you and how we ought to serve others in a way that is pleasing to you. And God, I pray for all of us, Lord, that you be merciful to us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit work in us, draw us closer to you, so that, Lord, truly when we, we live, others can also see that we are different from them. We are different from just uh, people who go to you for help as if you were some Santa Claus. But God, we pray that you, you help us to reflect a true relationship with you, one of joy and one of victory, 
And when others look at us, they see a true hope that we have uh, that is beyond this world, Lord. And God, we pray that this will draw more people to want to know you. So Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayer. We want to ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.